we're live. Welcome, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed the conference thus far, and thanks so much for hanging in there until the very end. So for those of you who listen to my podcast, um, I'm, and for those of you who don't, uh, my name is Jerry Landry. I'm the host of the Presidencies of the United States. And those of you who have listened to my podcast know that I'm one for doing the deep dive into the annals of history. But given that we have a limited time together, this is going to be a higher level summary. So I hope you'll bear with me as I try to practice brevity. Um, I'm considering this an exercise in brevity. So to get us started, when a certain group rebels, when they speak of their reasons why, they typically use the word freedom in describing their goals. Indeed, the United States began as a certain group felt that their rights were being taken away and they sought freedom. However, as with all words and as an English major by training, my mind instantly goes to trying to pinpoint what is actually meant by freedom. And as definitions often do, that can differ depending on the context. Even in the present day, when Americans have questions about how something is working or should work with our national institutions, we often refer back to certain key historical documents for guidance. At the top of this list are the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. However, when we refer to those documents in their original form, it is rather odd to find that word that is seen as being so key to the American identity, freedom, notably absent. In the Declaration, the word free is only used in the list of the colonists' grievances. On the Constitution, free is only used to define free persons as opposed to those enslaved. The word freedom is used in the First Amendment to the Constitution, which was part of the Bill of Rights. This came about soon after ratification of the Constitution. Now, the impetus for the Bill of Rights was that various leaders up and down the eastern seaboard noted absences in the original document that they felt would threaten the freedom of the new nation's citizens. Despite this well-known example, there seems to be a popular misconception that the American Revolution secured American freedoms. But as we see when we study the post-revolution history, it quickly becomes clear that there were folks who did not feel that their freedom was at all secured. Indeed, it was in part in response to another rebellion, the one dubbed Shays Rebellion in the late 1780s, that we see a new government created under the Constitution. This government, and in particular the executive branch, was crafted with the idea of George Washington, who was a unifying figure seen as symbolizing the ideals of the revolution, taking charge as the first president of the United States. Now, those of you who listen to my podcast, you'll know that there were still many, many questions about the role of the president, even after Washington's inauguration. But it was felt that Washington would help to bring some stability to the government and to the, and to the United States. After all, everyone could get behind Washington, and that meant there would be no more rebellions, right? Well, as this presentation is titled The Rebellions, plural, of the early presidencies, you can guess that there are going to be a number of rebellions that pop up in the late 18th century and early 19th century America. The first and probably best known of those is the Whiskey Rebellion. The Whiskey Rebellion occurred in western Pennsylvania in response to what in response to a government tax on distilled spirits which was intended to raise revenue to help to get the federal government's finances back in order. Now, the lawmakers in Philadelphia, which was the capital at the time, didn't understand that whiskey was pivotal to the economy of the West. As there was little hard currency in the West and transportation systems were underdeveloped, distillation created a more easily transportable product, which could also be used in a barter system as a pseudo currency. The whiskey tax, as it was dubbed, disrupted all of that and was seen as an imposition on the freedom and prosperity of the West. For a bit, the rebellion was more bluster than action. But once the home of the chief tax inspector in Western Pennsylvania was attacked, excuse me, uh, but once the home of the chief tax, tax inspector in Western Pennsylvania was attacked, 
President Washington mobilized the militia force and personally led it into the area to suppress the rebellion. By the time Washington's force got there, they found no rebels to fight, as all of them had gone home. But that didn't stop the armed forces from interrogating and arresting some of the leaders, though these leaders were later either acquitted or the charges were pardoned. Um, Washington actually set a precedent in this by pardoning those who were remaining um, leaders who were facing charges. The Whiskey Rebellion would not be the only civil unrest that Pennsylvania would see in the 1790s, however. Freeze's Rebellion would start up much closer to the national capital, as you can see in this map. And that's one thing to consider when um, looking at the Whiskey Rebellion versus Freeze's Rebellion, because the Whiskey Rebellion happened in western Pennsylvania, far away from the capital. It took a while to get there, but Freeze's Rebellion happened right on the doorstep of the federal government. This rebellion got its name from one of its leaders, John Freeze, who was also a local, local auctioneer. As with the Whiskey Rebellion, this rebellion had its roots in opposition to new taxes imposed by the federal government, but in this case, it was to collect revenue to ramp up the nation's defenses for a possible war with France. Again, there's too little time to go into much detail here, but one other point that I wanted to note about this rebellion is that there was also a layer of factionalism going on, and it really speaks to kind of where the nation was at the time. So the primary participants in this rebellion were known as the Kirchenluther, roughly translated to church people. They were German Lutheran and German reform citizens who tended to support Jefferson's faction, the Democratic Republicans. Now, there were German sectarians in the region. They tended to support the Federalists, and thus it was this group, not the Kirchenluther, who were chosen for positions as tax collectors. And this was due to their association with the Federalist Party, which was then in power in charge of the federal government. Now, Freeze's Rebellion ended up not being quite as large scale as the Whiskey Rebellion, but the response to it was quite similar. So as with the Whiskey Rebellion, a military force was put together and sent into the area. Uh, as with the Whiskey Rebellion, some of the leaders, including John Freeze, were taken into custody. And in this case, Freeze and two other participants were sentenced to death. But we also see with Freeze's Rebellion, like in the Whiskey Rebellion, President Adams issued an absolute pardon to all those involved in Freeze's Rebellion. And this was actually against the advice of his cabinet. Now, while I highlighted these two, it should be noted there, that there were other grumblings in other parts of the nation, particularly in the West, from people who felt that the new federal government was working against their interests. So I just highlighted a few here. Um, again, we don't really have any time to go into them in depth, but I just want to, you to know that this wasn't just a Pennsylvania thing. This was all across the nation, and it reflects that this was still a very uncertain time for the new nation. But likewise, I should note that ideas of freedom and rebellion were not just in the minds of the white population of the early United States. Since 1619, people of African descent were transported to what became the United States and enslaved. One can imagine that they didn't need eloquent speeches to invoke ideas of freedom and revolution in their minds, but they also faced greater obstacles than white people if they rebelled. And there, were, and there was little likelihood that any enslaved individuals, if caught, would be acquitted or pardoned. Despite the dangers, there were still those who rebelled, either on an individual basis or in an organized group. In addition to facing rebellions out in other parts of the nation, there was actually a rebellion that happened in President Washington's own house that I thought worthy of noting. Ona Judge was born in slavery at Mount Vernon in 1773. While she was born on land owned by George Washington, Ona herself wasn't directly owned by Washington 
directly. Rather, she was considered the property of the estate of Martha Washington's late first husband, Daniel Custis. Washington administered the estate and thus had control over Ona and the other individuals that were owned by the estate, but he could not sell them without paying back the estate. And any individuals that were enslaved under the any individuals that were enslaved under the estate who escaped, he was responsible for compensating the estate for because they had escaped under his watch. I wanted to provide that context because that will help us to understand his reactions in a minute. Now, Ona was a particular favorite of Martha Washington and was often responsible for serving Martha or her two grandchildren who she and George helped to raise. When Washington became president, in order to keep the expenses for running the president's house low, he brought some of the people that he enslaved from Mount Vernon up to the house in the Capitol. Now, this was okay when the Capitol was originally in New York City, but shortly after Washington assumed office, it was decided to move the Capitol to Philadelphia, and it remained there for 10 years until it moved down to Washington, D.C. Now, the problem with Philadelphia was that by Pennsylvania law, any enslaved individuals in the state were automatically considered free after six months in the state. Now, Washington couldn't have that. So to get around this, but not share this with the enslaved individuals in his household, because, of course, he wouldn't want them to know about this. He would come up with a reason for them to leave. You know, either he would say, oh, I'm going to be generous and let you go and visit your family back at Mount Vernon or, oh, I forgot something at Mount Vernon. Would you mind going to get this? or I need you to pick up something from Baltimore, from somebody in New Jersey, basically anything to get them across the state line. Because once they crossed that state line, the clock was reset, and then they could serve another six months enslaved in his household. Well, as I imagine most of you know, Washington served two terms in office, so that's eight years. After so many years, it was inevitable that the individuals that were enslaved in the household would hear of this Pennsylvania law because of their interactions with people in the market or other people in the free black community in, in Philadelphia. And so, but in that, many of them were willing to bide their time and wait because they knew he wasn't going to be president forever. For Ona, the decision to rebel and seek her freedom came when her future became uncertain. Now, Ona had learned in 1796 that Martha Washington was planning to give her to one of her nieces who was getting married. Now, this niece was noted as having, quote, a mercurial temperament. Also, in her considerations and in this new environment, there was also the new husband to consider. Enslaved individuals, in particular young women, were at great risk for sexual abuse and violence from white males in the household. Now, up until this point, Ona had been, by and large, secured from that because she slept in the bedroom with the grandchildren that I mentioned earlier, and it was seen as kind of a, a safe place. You know, the any men that were in the household weren't likely to go in with Washington's grandchildren and do anything to Ona. But in this new situation, that was completely uncertain. She didn't know this man. She knew the niece, and obviously she didn't have a great reputation. So Ona was faced with a choice. She had to choose between the uncertainty of continued enslavement and the uncertainty of seeking her freedom. And in that, she decided to rebel and seek her freedom. So on May 21st, 1796, she snuck out of the president's house. She eventually settled in New Hampshire, married a free man of color, and had kids. But the Washington family made numerous attempts to get her back. So as I mentioned earlier, Washington would have to pay back the estate for losing Ona. 
And so he had a great motivation to get her back. But luckily, she was able to live out the rest of her life free, though it should be noted that the potential risk of re-enslavement was always there the rest of her life. Now, for others in the enslaved population, they found strength in numbers when they thought of rebelling. One of the most famous slave uprisings in the history of the early United States occurred in the presidency of Washington's successor, John Adams, and this one was dubbed Gabriel's Rebellion. Now, this plot was named after one of its principal leaders, an enslaved man named Gabriel, and it was quite wide-reaching in its scope. So it was centered around the Richmond area, but word spread as far as Norfolk, Virginia, which is 90 or so miles away. Now, the problem with this, the more people that heard about the plot, the more likelihood that something would slip. Somebody from the white community would hear and word would get back to those in power and they would be shut down. But they still wanted to take that risk. So on August 30th, 1800, they went ahead with their plans for the uprising. But the problem was bad weather worked against them. So it came a torrential rain, thunderstorm. They had to call off what their plans were. But in that, somebody told. Somebody was caught. And eventually, many people were rounded up. This rebellion failed, and it ended up that 27 individuals, including Gabriel, were executed for their role in this rebellion. Now, the executions didn't stop because it was finally seen as being too much for any ethical reasons. They were called off because when the state, when, when the government executed an enslaved individual, they had to pay back the slave owner, and that was getting pretty pricey. So instead, they decided to force other enslaved individuals to be sold to a slave trader and transport it out of Virginia. They weren't going to execute them, but they did not want them around the state, knowing that they had played a part in an uprising. I should also mention that there were two white abolitionists involved in the plot but neither of them was ever prosecuted. So again, as with our earlier examples, I did want to point out that this wasn't just something in the Virginia area. There were uprisings and, and plots that were happening in many places in the original 13 colonies, but also in lands further west that would ultimately become a part of the United States, as you can see on this map. In these various plots, enslaved individuals engaged in rebellion against captivity. These are just the ones that we know about, but there are likely many other stories that are lost to the annals of history. But I think it's important when considering the history of the early republic to keep these rebellions in mind as, in mind as well. But we should also consider a rebellion that occurred in the Caribbean, starting in Washington's first term. On August 22, 1791, individuals enslaved in the north part of the French colony of Saint-Domingue, the western portion of the island of Hispaniola, rose up against their captors. Now, as you can see, we refer to this as the Haitian Revolution, rather than a rebellion. So why is that? Why do we use that word revolution rather than rebellion? Namely, because it was successful. From a less organized group who fought with anything that they could make into weapons, to army forces under the commands of generals such as Jean-Jacques Dessalines, André Rigaud, and Toussaint Louverture, though it took many years and a narrative much longer and more complicated than we have time to discuss today, ultimately the nation of Haiti was born in 1804. As with other rebellions that we've discussed, the Haitian Revolution was rooted in the idea of freedom, an idea that filled some with hope and others with dread. And indeed, the question of Haiti would be one that lasted 
up until the 20th and even the 21st century when you look at American presidential history. Even two and a half centuries after the Declaration of Independence, the citizens of the United States still debate what the word freedom means. And we still struggle with making decisions as to when to be complacent or when to rebel against authorities that we feel are threatening either our freedoms or the freedoms of others. However, beyond just the examples of the Declaration and the Constitution, we now have another document that we can refer to in our contemplations. In a speech delivered in the midst of the American Civil War on the side of one of the most pivotal battles of that conflict, President Abraham Lincoln declared, quote, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. This address serves as a reminder that when we are considering the concept of freedom, we should remember that its preservation is not always without conflict, that sometimes we have to be persistent in seeking it, and that sometimes the word requires a new definition or to be applied in a new way or to a new group in order to make it a more truthful ideal and tenet of what it means to be American. So that is the end of this presentation, but I did want to point out that this the subjects that I've talked about in this presentation, I've discussed at length over the course of the last few years in the Presidency's podcast. And so I've referenced a few of the episodes uh, from the Washington Presidency, from the Adams Presidency, and from the Jefferson Presidency series that I've talked about some of these, um, some of these rebellions. I did also want to make a point of noting my photo credits and my sources. But at this time, I would like to open up the floor to questions and I will go ahead and shop, stop sharing. Uh, it looks like you have one from Bree right here. That uh, Would you like me to read it? Yes, please. That would be great. Uh, so from Bree, do you think that American, that, Amer that America's history of rebellion has an impact on what is going on right now? If this is the next step in a legacy, uh, in the leg in a legacy of the struggle for equality, absolutely, I think that it is very much rooted and and it's part of that American identity. You know, we you see numerous instances in American history where we talk about this legacy of revolution. Well, revolution and rebellion. It depends on the success or failure as to whether you label it one or the other. And I think that it is very much rooted in the American identity and in the American history. We challenge, we question, we try to find new ways of doing things. But then also we have a streak of more lowercase conservative thought where we can also be complacent where we can um, be content with the status quo. And I think that's important to consider as well. But I think that, that that back and forth is a big portion of American history. And in terms of the presidencies, we're going to be discussing it quite a bit moving forward. Uh, here's a question from Kara. Uh, is there a particular founding father you feel resonates with you or that you feel could never or that you feel that you can never tire learning about? Hmm. That's a good question. I mean, there are so many interesting characters. Um, I really every time I come back to John Adams, I find something new. And, and John Adams is one that most people don't really think about. Um, quite as much, but he's just such a fascinating figure. But then there are also some of the, the lesser known figures of the, the founding fathers. Um, in particular, I'm thinking of, uh, I'm writing an episode right now and uh, found something about Governor Morris, who um, 
helped to draft the Constitution. And Governor Morris is a a character and a half, um, especially he's almost a scandalous character. Um, so he's fascinating to learn about. Uh, there are also some of those thinkers that don't really get quite as much attention, but that were pivotal, like John Taylor of Caroline. Studying him is, it can be rather dry, but you also see the threads of intellectual thought that continue on through um, Calhoun, through conservative ideology and thinking, even into the 20th and 21st century. So those are just a few that are coming off the top of my head. Mm. Oh, here's a good one from Caroline. It sounds like uh, in the early days that the military was used to put down rebellions, but now the military is not used. Do you think, uh, do you know when this changed and why? Well, and so it's interesting because, and especially considering this time period, because we think of the standing army and the standing military as it is in the 20th and 21st century. But at this point, the army really, like the, the standing army was a few hundred individuals. And most of them were actually based out in the Western portion of the United States. They were mainly in involved in conflicts with native nations and native peoples. Whenever something like the Whiskey Rebellion or Freeze's Rebellion happened, basically they had to call it the militia. And that's something that we don't really have a, a parallel for nowadays, but the militias were set up. There was, a, you know, there were militia systems across the states in varying degrees. Um, and you actually see people like uh, Secretary of War Henry Knox, who tried to push forward reform to kind of standardize the militia to be along the lines of what we would think of as the National Guard nowadays. But that failed. And so, you know, you would have one militia that was very that was rather well trained and then another militia that basically they would go for their militia service and it would just be a weekend of drinking. Um, but whenever something like that happened closer to the national capital on the eastern seaboard, they would have to call up these militias. They would have to uh, send word to the governors of the states to get a militia force together, send it and put it under a unifying um, force. So we still do see, and, and that's the thing, like we, we see nowadays more, um, and especially since 9-11, we see more of a militarization of the police and the police kind of acting in that role. Um, we do see instances of the National Guard being called out for certain service. Um, so we still have some vestiges of that nowadays, but it it does look a bit different since you know from the early republic and what it what it was then. Interesting. Uh, from Bree uh, again, Mike Duncan has repeatedly referred to the Haitian Revolution as having radicalized him in his political thinking. Having brought that up, do you feel something similar, uh, or can you point to some event that has fundamentally impacted your politics? Absolutely. And, and the Haitian Revolution, and one of the reasons I really wanted to include this in here, is that when you read, when you read biographies of presidents and the early presidents, the Haitian Revolution may get a mention, but it really doesn't play too large of a role in the narrative. But when you start to look at the documents and you start to look at you start to look at the Haitian Revolution in the context of the slaveocracy that was in place at the time, you start to understand that they considered it a big deal. Um, here you have a group of enslaved people rising up in a rebellion and nobody can stop it. The officials in Saint-Domingue couldn't stop it. The French army couldn't stop it. The British got involved. The Spanish got involved. Nobody could stop this group. And ultimately, they ended up with a black republic very close to 
the United States. And as with anything, you know, we we often underestimate the power of the word of mouth and word was going to get out. And indeed, we do see instances of enslaved people in the United States learning about the Haitian Revolution. Um, and so it was it, it fed into these fears of the slave owners of the, the slave owning class that this may happen here. This may happen in my plantation or my community or my state. So it was a very big deal. And I think that the Haitian Revolution deserves more study. I think that I highly recommend Mike Duncan's revolution series on the Haitian Revolution. And I would say that that series really did impact me thinking, making sure that I think outside of the box, making sure that I think outside of what historians of the modern day or, or close to the modern day think is important and really trying to get a sense of what the people of that time thought was important. And likewise, it has made me really this entire process of working on the presidency's podcast has made me think and rethink, well, how are people going to view us? in 20 years time or 50 years time or 100 years time what are they going to think of our time what are they going to think of us what are they how are they going to judge us or are they going to take that time to really get to know us i think that more than anything has been the greatest lesson from my experience podcasting thus far making sure that I'm living as I hope that people will judge me. I think it's a really good response. Um, from Alexander. Uh, first of all, Alexander is also very into the uh, Revolutions Haitians episode. So I'm sure I can see there's a few people who are all very much enjoying that. Uh, but Alexander asks, uh, for the early tax rebellions, uh, oh, so, yeah, for the early tax rebellions, was their aim just to pressure the federal government to drop the tax, or were there any of them aiming for the actual overthrow of the political order or to secede? Similarly, for the revolts of enslaved people, were their aims generally to escape or the actual overthrow of the political order? So thank you for that question. Um, that's and that's one of the things that's interesting in looking at these various rebellions because there were some that had very clear aims and there are others that it, it felt like, Oh, well, we're kind of going to figure it out as we go along. Um, with the tax revolts, there really was more of a focus on kind of repealing the tax and making sure that their voices were heard by the federal government. There wasn't, you know, there were some elements that were starting to talk about, well, maybe we should just break off and maybe we should just do our own thing. Um, but it seems like more of the aim was focused on repealing the taxes. But that's also important to consider in terms of, and, and especially in the Washington presidency and the Adams presidency, you see numerous instances, and, and especially the further west you go, you have individuals who are settling these new places, um, white individuals who are settling these new places. And and especially when it comes to trade on the Mississippi River, because that was a big contention. The western portion, so west of the Appalachian Mountains, the Appalachian Mountains were a barrier to trade. All the river systems flowed towards the Mississippi, so they needed access to the Mississippi River. And anytime that was disrupted and anytime that there was a problem with that, the economy of the West suffers. And so it ultimately became you, you see people and you even see leaders like George Rogers Clark, who was who fought in the American Revolution, who started saying in the 1790s, well, maybe we need to break off and, you know, we can maybe join with Spain or the British are still kind of playing a role here. Maybe 
maybe we do need to do our own thing. And um, there's actually, and, and again, I don't have time to really go into it now, but um, the Trans Oconee Republic is one of them that I, I noted on the um, map slide that is kind of interesting. They really didn't know what they were doing, but declared their independence anyway. Um, now, in terms of enslaved individuals uprising and in, in rebellion, um, their aims were to seek independence um, for themselves, but then also, and especially you see this in Gabriel's Rebellion, they're starting to think through, well, okay, what do we do after we rebel? You know, what, what, do we, what demands do we make? In some cases, you know, they were starting to think, well, maybe a certain place could be designated for us. Maybe we could have a geography that was ours. Um, but then you also see, and, and this one actually came out of um, Gabriel's Rebellion, the Easter Conspiracy in 1802, which was rather disorganized. And they didn't really, from what we know, from the existent documents. And, and again, I, I do offer that as a caveat. Um, in many cases, individuals didn't have a way to capture their thoughts. They um, wouldn't have been able to read or write. And so those portions of this history is lost. But from what we know, it doesn't seem like the Easter conspiracy that they really had clear aims. Um, they just decided they were going to start rebelling and then kind of figure things out as they go along. Um, so there's wide variations in that, um, but that's part of the fascinating nature of this. And I think that's part of the fascinating, whenever you start to consider these ideas of um, rebellion and freedom, depending on the group, depending on the context, it can look very, very different. Interesting. Uh, from David, uh, with many of the rebellions taking place at what was then near frontier tor territory, how did the quote-unquote mainstream shift to accommodate those social pressures, both regarding slavery and other reasons? So, and, and that's an interesting uh, question. So, you see part of it, and especially um, part of the reason for the Louisiana Purchase, and this is this is really one that is, it's probably the best example of, of trying to meet the needs of these um, Western frontier um, merchants and planters and all that. Um, like I said, the Mississippi River was crucial to the West and to Western settlers. So you see at the beginning of Jefferson's presidency, the port of New Orleans was basically the port that they had to get to. And basically they would unload the ships from the river boats and they would move, they would move the, um, the cargo to boats that were set up to, for more long range travel. So actually traveling across the ocean and across the Gulf. Um, in the early part of Jefferson's presidency, the Spanish intendant at New Orleans closes the port to American merchants. And this causes an, a, a huge uproar in the West because, you know, now they've got all these crops, they've got all these products that they can't move, they can't do anything with. And it becomes a back and forth and it's, it's really fascinating. I've been covering this the last few episodes of the podcast um, to see kind of how long it takes for communication to get from the West to the national capital, to the negotiations that were taking place in Paris back and forth. And finally you end up with the Louisiana purchase. And that wasn't even really their aim. Their aim was just, let's get New Orleans. So that way we can have New Orleans. We can make sure that, that port is always um, open to American trade. But when we get the Louisiana Purchase, this creates a whole new, you know, it, it solves one set of problems and it creates another set of problems. Um, but 
but it really was intended to meet those needs. It really was meant to make that shift. Um, now, in terms of enslavement, and and again, like the, the Louisiana Purchase feeds into that in, in a way that we don't really have time to cover, but part of the problem with slavery and why as the 19th century goes on, there are more instances of slave uprisings and slave rebellions that we start to note in the historical record because it really wasn't met. Like those needs were not met. They weren't seen as being important enough um, to meet. And so you end up with the Civil War. You end up with a legacy that we're still living with to this day. Very neat. Jerry, thank you so much for presenting to us. Everyone, we hope to see you at the uh, closing remarks that are about to start. Uh, you can, you know how to get there. You know how to use Crowdcast at this point. Jerry, thank you so much for being here with all of us. Thank you so much, Andrew, and thank you so much, everyone.